Welcome everyone, it's Deacon Steve Greco and Mary Ann Greco, and welcome to the Bible and You. you. <laughs> it's so wonderful to be with you again, and, and blessings upon your family, upon you, and and may the, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ cover you and protect you against all evil and against everything that may impact you. Uh, may you just be filled with the Holy Spirit and filled with every spiritual blessing. Um, one of the things that I think is so, so important is this weekend, right? This weekend. Another exciting um, oh, yeah. liturgical weekend. Uh, it's the most holy body and blood of Christ, solemnity, uh, which is also called what? Corpus Christi. Cor Corpus Christi. And what is Corpus Christi? You're supposed to explain. Oh that. yeah, okay. <laughs> no, this is this is about the Eucharist. Obviously, this is about uh, this important feast, this important solemnity, is really about the real presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. From the earliest of times, the you know we, we were in, in Rome and in, in the catacombs, right? Mm -hmm. And in the catacombs, we saw pictures of the Eucharist, of Mass, and so forth. In uh, edged in the rock and so forth. So the earliest of times the Christians believed in the true presence of our Lord Jesus well, Christ. Well, this particular reading just points it out that Jesus initiated it you know, before he even was crucified. He told them what he expected. And this is all, again, part of kind of the Last Supper and, and what Jesus wants to do before he ascends into heaven. He really wants to uh, let us know that he's going to be with us through his body and blood. Absolutely. So should we take a, a, a listen to the gospel reading? Actually, I, I do want to say that this is this particular reading from John is written, um, is about Jesus when he's in around the Sea of Galilee. He has just preached about the bread and had the multiplication of the loaves, and people are looking for him, and Jesus has returned to Capernaum, which is his like we might say headquarters town, the town where Peter lived and his mother-in-law. And so the crowd follows him. And this particular um, passage is taken when Jesus was talking in the uh, Jewish synagogue in the little town of Capernaum, which is just in the center of town. We've been there, and it's just a few feet from uh, Peter's mother-in-law's house. Yeah, it's an amazing place, right, yeah. uh, in Capernaum. And he gave this this teaching. Uh, yeah, this there. is where he did. And so, okay. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory like to you, o Lord. Lord. Jesus said to the Jewish uh, crowds, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. This is so powerful. This is, this is, this is really earth-shattering. This is life-changing in just a huge way. What's your first response to what Jesus is talking about here? Well, he starts out saying he's the living bread. And they're kind of used to that, the Jewish people. And he's done talked about being the living bread before. And he's talking about, you know, the regular bread, the manna in the desert, which is in the first reading, kept them alive, but then they would die. But now he's talking about being the living bread that will keep them alive forever. And so that's, that's different. So that's my first, but then he takes it to another level. He says, I am the living um, bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And then he says, is, um, and the bread that I will give is my flesh 
for the life of the world. Now he takes it to a whole different level. And this is something that's just kind of shocking because the word that he's using in this uh, translation, we don't have, you know, it's hard in English to translate. Right. But uh, basically, it's like saying flesh like that of an animal, like a lion tearing up a flesh. And so, you know, the picture that he is going out of his way to describe here is not an easy one for them to, to uh, take in. He's gone from living bread, which is kind of neat and clean, to, to something that's, you know, drastically different. This is so powerful and so important because... For the Jews listening in, obviously this was just incredulous, and many of them left. Right, they did leave, and and part of it is because here they were, they weren't even having animals with blood in them, and now he's talking about almost like cannibalism. They they didn't get it. I mean, it was like, what are you saying? This is horrible. And so many of the disciples left, and and for many of us, we still find it very difficult to understand transubstantiation, you know, really what that means of turning bread and wine into the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's very neat if we look at it as just bread and wine. And that's that's easy. We don't think about it too much. But if we really talk about what happens to that bread and wine, that it actually becomes Jesus' body, then it takes on such a deep level of meaning that we need to really celebrate and and really meditate on it it'll change your whole life in fact a lot of people i've read a lot of stories have been uh converted from protestant um, beliefs to catholic because they have experienced something uh either they were attending a mass with someone and when they held up the the uh host they they actually felt the presence of jesus so you know this is life-changing now, this spiritual food, the body and blood of Christ, transforms us. In fact, St. Thomas Aquinas wrote extensively uh, about the Eucharist, and he said that regular food gives us lost strength and increases our vitality, but spiritual food changes the person who eats it into itself. Thus, the conversion of a man into Christ so that he may no longer live, but Christ lives in him. It is so absolutely critical for us to understand the critical nature. And this coming weekend, obviously in the Orange Diocese, we are going back to Mass and, and be able to receive the body and blood of Christ. So this particular timing of this is just so, so critical. And, you know, Thomas Aquinas is saying... Um, it's, it's not customary and obviously horrific for men to eat human flesh and drink blood, and therefore Christ's flesh and blood are set before us to be partaking of under the species of those which are more commonly used by men, namely bread and wine. And so again, Jesus is giving of himself and giving love uh, to all of us and, and, and fuel to yeah. be able to have the yeah. uh, uh, the grace to be able to withstand the challenges of, of the enemy and the challenges of the In day. a very uh, personal way, he's doing that. And I think one of the th another thing that we miss in the translation is the word eat. Eat means uh, not just like nicely dining, but gnawing, like an animal gnaws on an animal. So he said, take and eat. He chooses his words that are much deeper and, and take it all in and then drinking the wine and the blood which he talks about um the word he used in that also meant congealed uh blood so it wasn't just regular blood even it was you know thicker blood and and so this is just outstanding but it really comes down to are we going to believe or not and, you know, and are you going to believe what Jesus said? Exactly. And this is something that is so important. So many people have challenged it over the years. In fact, the Council of Trent, and, and if you don't have um, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, please order it because it's so important. And, and there's so much in here talking about the Eucharist. And, and number 376 says the Council of Trent summarizes the Catholic faith by declaring, because Christ our Redeemer said it was truly his body 
that he was offering under the species of bread. It's always been the conviction of the Church of God and this Holy Council now declares again that by the consecration of the bread and wine, there takes place a change of the whole substance of the bread into the substance of the body of Christ our Lord and the whole substance of the wine into the substance of his blood. This change, the Holy Catholic Church is fittingly and properly called transubstantiation. Uh, so, and, and Thomas Aquinas, uh, they quote in, in number 1381, the Catechism, said the only way you can understand this is really by faith, which relies on divine authority, which is what you were talking about. Yeah, you can't, we can't wrap our minds around what this is doing. And, you know, later on we'll talk about even scientists can't, can't um, come up with explanations. You know, you have to believe. And, uh, you know, science has tried. And what a gift this is. Uh, one of my favorite books is Mother, I have like 20 books on Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa, No Greater Love. And she talks about um, what Jesus did. He loved us so much. He came into the world. He wanted to satisfy our hunger for God. And what did he do? He made himself the bread of life. He became small, fragile, and defenseless for us. Bits of bread can be so small that even a baby can chew it, even a dying person can eat it. He became the bread of life to satisfy our hunger for God um, and our hunger for love. And, and so again, it's so, so important to understand that God is love, Jesus is love, and he says, I love you so much that I become the body and blood of, of, you know, I give you my body and give so you my blood. So that you may have eternal life. And I think one of the things kind of reminds me of is when a baby's born, it's born with the immunities from the mother's body and it's kept strength. And when we, he's saying, you know, I'm giving you my flesh and my blood so that you may have eternal life. I feel like he's giving us himself so that we can have eternal life kind of like the immunities you know that we have it because we're taking jesus in amen and and the fruits of the whole, of holy communion as found in again the uh catechism of the catholic church number 1391 holy communion augments our union with christ the principal fruit of receiving the eucharist and holy communion is an intimate union with christ jesus Holy Communion, again, is just so, so important. And the quote again is, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Uh, later on in 1391, the Catechism says, Holy Communion separates us from sin. The body of Christ we receive in Holy Communion is given up for us, and the blood we drink shed for the, for the many for the forgiveness of sins. So again, so, so important. And, and it's life-changing, and it's so critical for people to understand that this incredible gift from our Lord Jesus Christ is meant that we may be filled with him and with his presence to be able to be united in him. Abide in me, and I will abide in you. He says, just like the... I abide in the, no, let me see. It says, just as the living father sent me, I have life because of the father. So also the one who feeds on me will have life of me. So, you know, those who eat the body and blood of Christ will have life in Jesus. Just like the relationship he has with his father. It's very intimate, very and Exactly. And it, it relates to John 15. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me, I will abide in them. I will remain in them, and they will remain in me. So again, the, the scripture reading, the gospel reading, is that now he is the living bread, and when we eat that living bread, we eat, eat again Jesus, we will live forever, and he's given it to the life of the world. Um, and again, the, Jewish, the Jews quarrel, quarreled among themselves. And Jesus is saying something now incredibly important, and remember... When he says, amen, amen, uh, 26 times in the Gospel of John, this means this is incredibly important. Yeah, listen up, folks. Listen up. <laughs> he says, amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. And whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. So many people fight that. So many people think, oh, well, you know, he's just being symbolic. Unfortunately, two-thirds of Catholics don't believe in the real presence. And this has to change. We have to be true evangelists 
in which we let people know this is not symbolic. This is real. This is the real presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, and I, I think um, I heard someone say, it's like the, the Protestants can say, oh, it's symbolic. And we can even rationalize, oh, he meant it symbolically. But then all these people walked away because what he said was so profound and drastic. And we don't hear Jesus saying, wait a minute, guys, I, I meant to, you know, it's really symbolic what I said. So come back. You're not understanding. He stuck to his word. This is what he meant. Yeah. And, and, and from the earliest times, that. scholars like Justin Martyr in the second century, uh, many scholars, again, we talked about Thomas Aquinas, many other scholars, verified and solidified the fact that this is the true presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. So, so as we as we go on, it, it says, um, again, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him, just as the living Father sent me and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that comes down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. Now, so many people have tried to disprove this. So many people have tried to say, oh, this isn't really true. And you've got some stories. There's many what we call Eucharistic miracles. I love the word miracle. I wrote four books on miracles. Uh, tell us about some of the, the, there's so many of them, but tell us about some of the ones that you like well, the most. I, it's interesting. Um, I, I've kind of looked up some miracles and miracles come in many forms. You know, they can come from, um, uh, uh, blood that's the host is bleeding and when it's transformed or they could also have uh, it's preserved for long periods of time or there's uh, lots of things around it but I picked the ones where it's actually been transformed into the flesh and the blood and I picked uh, the one of the most uh, uh, ones we recognize the miracle of Lasciano no wait a minute before you go any further were we there? Yes, we were there. We were there. Yes. We saw it in person. Yeah, it was quite profound. It's just last year, just early like last year. Being in the presence of Jesus. And that happened around the year 750. And it happened when the priest who was saying Mass was um, doubting in his soul the true presence of Christ in the, uh, in the consecration of, of the, during the Mass. And as he held up the host, he all of a sudden saw blood coming from it. And, you know, he was in tears and he composed himself. And then he, he had people come up to say, see it close. And then, of course, they venerated it. And it wasn't until, I think, let me see, 1970 that they actually tested uh, what they had put it in. And so for all those years, it was in uh, some sort of thing, but it wasn't hermetically sealed or anything. But yet it, it was uh, not corrupt. So in 1970, they tested it, and uh, they found this. They found that the host had turned into, or was, a muscle heart mm -hmm. and, and uh, from the, the heart wall, and that it was AB blood. And, and we see the five, there's five separate... Oh, I was uh, going to share that Yeah, later. go ahead, yeah. <laughs> okay, and, and, there's, and the blood itself goes into five... Um, little uh, globs of, of blood and the really interesting part is they weighed each one and each one weighed the same as the other e even though they were of different sizes but then when they put the five little pieces together they still weighed the same amount and scientists were just bewildered they have no explanation of how that can be but that's what they found in 1970 and then I, you know, I've kind of got some more recent miracles because I think we have better science. And, you know, a lot of people can say, oh, that's just folklore, you know, and they didn't have science. But here we start in 1970, we have more science and it goes all the way up to recent times where we actually have science that's even better. So in 1992, 1994, and 1996, we have Miracle of the Eucharist in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And in 1996, that particular one, the Eucharist was uh, bleeding uh, when it was consecrated. And so they took it in for testing. And in 1996, it's more recent. And the test came back that it was part of the uh, tissue of the heart. 
Um, and actually, one of the scientists that they gave the, the material to, they had no idea where the material or what it was. They just tested it and said, this is what it is. And so anyway, it's the left ventricle of the heart. And the uh, tissue from the heart also revealed that uh, it was someone who had been in great stress and someone who hadn't, um, didn't have a lot of air was like suffocating at times. So I thought that was interesting. Um, and so we find that in the Philippines, I'm sorry, in, in uh, Buenos Aires. And what's interesting is Pope Francis today is the bishop who had it ordered to be tested. So he was right on top. Then I found in um, 2001, there was a miracle in India, and that was where the, the host turned, the blood started making the face and the crown of Jesus in it. And then we have, and you have to excuse the way I pronounce these names because I'm not sure I'm doing it correctly, but in 2006, in Texla, Mexico, the host was being distributed and it started bleeding. And there and again, they sent out tests. And it took several years. They did a whole host of tests, and it became, came in that it was human blood, and um, it was AB positive, and which is also the same uh, blood type they found on the Shroud of Turin. Uh, they also, um, the blood was coagulated, but inside of the blood, it was like fresh. So it was still like, you know, it had been all these years, and it was still like fresh blood. Okay, then we go to um, 2008 in Sokola, Poland, and uh, the Eucharist fell to the ground, and a consecrated, and what they do is they dissolve it in water, that's the way that they do with something like that, so they put it in a thing, and they dissolved it, but it didn't dissolve, they, saw, they took it out later, and they saw blood, so they sent it to scientists, two scientists. One did not know what it was or anything, and the other one did. And they both came out with the same results. They said it was a human heart muscle from the left side of the heart, the ventricle. And they even made the comment when the scientists that the, the blood tissue was still alive, you know, that it was like pulsating, she said, and that the person had had trauma. So... You know, those are some examples. How can you how can you deny that? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Scientists can't even you know, they're like saying this is the body and blood. And so, I mean, we today and I you know, why do you think we have more, there's actually been more of these happening oh. in more recent times? Excuse me. I, I, I love this book, Eucharistic Miracles, and it's by Joan Carol Cruz. But there are many, many books like this, and this goes into so many different miracles. We just covered yeah, just very few, but there are so many. Them. This is so important, you know, so you can get this online or, or just look it up and so forth. Just Google Eucharistic Miracles. I mean, it's so important that we increase our faith, that we increase our faith in which we basically say, I'm 1,000% certain that this is the body and blood of Christ. Well, you know, we've been talking about Thomas and how he was kind of a doubter. He wanted to touch Jesus and, and, and touch his side, and I won't believe it till I see the wound. Well, here we are in today's world, really, and we're doubting Thomas. We have a lot of things. Well, you know, those are stories. I can't really believe that. I'm kind of doubting. And the Lord loves us so much that he has allowed himself to be revealed this way so that even science tests it and prove consistently it's always the same blood type and i think it's so interesting it's always the the same part of the heart muscle which also i read somewhere is that they couldn't even conceive how that thin of a slice of, of heart could happen no one knew how it could possibly do it and there's so many more but it's like jesus does this so we will believe amen you're, you're on fire. I know. Well, it's really exciting. Fuego. <laughs> Bottom line is this. Don't have a single doubt. Not even a little bit of a doubt. Don't have a, even a little bit of a doubt that the real presence is there during the Mass. 
when when the priest consecrates and transubstantiation occurs and and through the eucharistic prayers uh that jesus is there on the altar for us we take it for granted we, we take really it for do. granted and all I, I keep thinking about so many ex-catholics right they say the second largest church in the united states is made up of ex-catholics yeah. who have left um how can you leave the catholic church at, you know, if you truly believe in, in the Mass and truly believe that in the real presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, especially to go to a church that doesn't sacrifice, uh, doesn't have the Mass, and, and so forth, and, and doesn't really some, believe. It's symbolic even. And, they, and it's interesting. They try to make it happen because they do it symbolically, but it's not the same. If you've ever visited another church, it's, you know, it's, you feel the difference. Okay. So with that being the case, and as, as we all know, we don't, we don't rehearse. <laughs> but, and so I love to put you on the spot. Uh -oh. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> okay, what? Are you a cradle Catholic? No, I'm a convert. Convert from where? Methodist. Methodist, okay. And did they believe in the real presence? No, we had once or twice a year, we had little, uh, little things of grape juice and, and bread that we passed around. And it was just kind of memor commemorating the Last Supper, and that was it. But, you know, he took it further and said, you know, this is more. And There's nothing symbolic about, no. about what happens during the Mass. And when you became Catholic, did it happen right away that you believed in the Real Presence? Or, or tell us about your story. Well, I don't really know. Did it happen right away? Probably not. I mean, I, I don't really remember. But, but as your faith grew? But I, you know, one thing I think the more I read, um, and this is more recent, but the more I read these stories of miracles, I think um, I've given this book to other people who are kind of on the, right. they're Catholics, but they don't really, you know, believe everything. And like you said, two-thirds don't believe? Well, no, the, the, I think it was Rutgers had the study that two-thirds of Catholics do not believe in the real presence. And I guarantee you that the majority, if not close to 100% of those that leave the church to go to another church. Oh, they couldn't believe it. They, they never yeah. really believed it. So, and so yeah. yeah, it's absolutely critical. So when you read these stories, for me, who's kind of the doubting Thomas and needs maybe science or, or needs to feel that or understand it, we can understand it, really. But we can understand It's a mystery. It's called it's the Paschal mis yeah. Mystery. And that science can't understand it either. Right. They, you know, but when the more you read about how Christ has presented Himself this way to, and it's usually because there's someone, it's to build the faith of people and the belief that Jesus, the presence of Jesus at at Mass with us, and it happens a lot when someone's doubting, you know, like priests or whatever. And so we all have doubts at times. But boy, if we shared these stories with people and they they read them i don't know how you could not believe well the other thing is for us just to be in the presence of our lord jesus christ go to adoration mm. be in the presence and ask the lord reveal to me the truth and he will reveal in your heart that he is right there in front of you yeah when we visited the miracle of la Ciano, i say it wrong but um, you know, you actually get about this far, wouldn't you say? I mean, you walk right up to the mm -hmm. container, and I mean, you feel the presence of Jesus. It's a very holy moment. You Re just <sighs> remember that, as as Saint Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas said, spiritual food changes the person who eats it. So think about that this weekend. If you're able to go to Mass, I know some people 65 and older are not, but if you're able to go to Mass, or when you go to Mass, because we certainly can go during the week, um, think about the real presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about this gift of eternal life that we receive through the, through the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, should we close in prayer? Absolutely. Heavenly Father, we ask special blessings upon all of you to receive that gift of faith, to receive the gift of life, to receive the gift of the power of the Holy Spirit, to reveal to you the truth that Jesus is the bread of life, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. May you be protected against all evil, protected against all illness and COVID-19. 
may you be covered with the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and that of your family, your loved ones, all those that you hold dear. May you be healed spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically and blessed with every spiritual blessing. And we bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Alleluia. Alleluia. <laughs> You're not sing. singing. <laughs> God bless you and your family and your loved ones. Thanks for tuning in and, and we'll let other it. people know about this. Again, it's on Spiritful Hearts Facebook page. So God bless you. We'll be with you next week at the same time. Tell your friends about it and have a really blessed week. Take care. Bye-bye now. Bye.